Okay, well, um, this teaching, uh, what I'd like to do to begin it is just take a moment to uh, reflect on some, some things that were happening when I was a kid, because I think it's really important right now that we understand that things are changing. Um, we live in a day when values and rules are changing all the time, and things that used to make the world feel relatively safe and somewhat stable, they're really no longer the stable fare. Um, that's, that's just not standard anymore. So when I was a kid, um, I'm ancient, so I'm a grandpa now, so I'm reminiscing, and some of you guys will be able to relate to this. But some of you that are younger, um, it, it'll sound a little different. Um, when I was a kid, we could play outside as kids till it was dark, and we never had to worry about predators. We never had to worry about anybody looking after us. Parents didn't supervise us outside. We just played and had fun and knew that um, we'd be safe. We were all with our neighbors. Um, everybody knew each other. Um, if you lived within a mile of school, you walked to school. You didn't get drove there by your parents. You walked and you, or you rode your bike. And if you rode your bike, and then you, um, you get there. Uh, we didn't lock our bikes. Almost no one got a bike stolen. That was a rare thing. You could just leave it there. Um, Sundays. Sundays were a day of rest for most people. The only people that I knew that worked on Sundays were essential services and shift workers. And all retail stores were closed. Sunday was a dead day. Uh, I couldn't even buy gas in the town that we grew up in. Uh, my mom and dad, if they needed gas on a Sunday, you had to go out to the highway to get it. And even the unchurched people knew that Sundays were a day of rest. Everyone looked for it. Even if they didn't go to a place of worship, they knew that Sunday was a different day. You didn't cut the grass. You didn't build a fence. You didn't, um, you didn't uh, disturb the peace on a Sunday morning. It was a different day than every day of the week. People were taught to respect their elders, their teachers, the police, offices of authority. We were taught, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. I was personally taught that it didn't matter if the amount was a nickel or a hundred bucks. You don't steal. Stealing is wrong. And I learned that when I stole a nickel. <laughs> Profanity was considered vulgar and inappropriate, and especially in mixed company. You never heard profanity on the radio or on television. Sex was something private between a married man and woman. And those were kind of typical of the rules that governed society back then when I was a kid. And it's not that everybody kept those rules because they didn't. Um, some of them broke them. And they cross, but when you crossed the line, you knew you crossed the line. Everyone knew it. And things were pretty clear. There seemed to be a right and wrong about most things. And so those were some of the rules that we lived by. And today we're seeing a lot of those rules changing and uh, quite rapidly actually. So I was having a conversation with my wife one day about some of these changings changes and some of the seeming lack of common sense that people just, it just seems to be missing in our world. And I made a comment that sort of landed for me that I think the Holy Spirit is actually speaking through me when I said it. And I said the reason that there is a lack of common sense is that there's no longer anything common among us. The standard that was once common for Canadian society has been rejected and people are basically doing what seems to be right in their own eyes. So I looked up the definition of common sense. I think most of us know it, but the, dif the dictionary definition is um, good sense and sound judgment in practical matters. The question is, who says what is good sense and sound judgment? Who sets the standard? I got thinking about this common sense and I realized that it's only present when we all have a common way of thinking or a common standard to which we submit. If we reject that standard, then all we're going to have is individualistic thinking and common sense cannot exist in that environment. In order for common sense to thrive, 
we really do need a standard of living, a set of rules to live by that's standard for everybody. And it's also got to be beneficial for everybody. It doesn't, it's not favoritism. And I know that in this day and age, there are people who would just go, oh, that just rubs me so the wrong way. We should have freedom to choose whatever we think is right. But honestly, that's called anarchy. I looked up the definition of anarchy and uh, there was three, three definitions there. One is lack of political authority. And one is, and it's starting to move to more towards where I wanna go, is disorder and confusion but the one that hit the nail on the head is anarchy is the absence of any common purpose or standard. Interesting, isn't it? The scenario isn't a new one. People have been doing what seems to be right in their own eyes for years and years, and the results have been varied. It seems like when people adopt God's way of doing life and his set of rules, it blesses people and it leads to life. And when people reject God's way and embrace something else, it does not bless, and nor does it lead people to life. So standard of wisdom of doing, God's, doing life God's way, it was actually revealed to the Israelites through the law. I looked something up, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I did look up and it seems that there are 613 laws in the scriptures to which um, the Israelites were supposed to follow. And I went, oh, wow, no wonder, no wonder no one can fill them perfectly. The average person just couldn't simply know all these laws or how to apply them. It, it required actually a special education and a lot of intense study. And that's what the Pharisees were all about. They were religious lawyers. They were separated and they did, they studied the law so that they could, um, impart it to Joe Average. Well, when Moses received the law from God, it was actually for everyone. It wasn't just for the religious lawyers. It was for all of God's people. And he was giving a standard of common sense by which all people could live godly lives. The Ten Commandments are basically a practical summary of all the law that was given to God's people. It's kind of the short list, if you will, so that uh, like a Coles Notes version so that everybody could get right to the chase and understand what the law was about. It wasn't just the full-time students. So let me read from Deuteronomy 4, and it, it's talking about these commandments, and it's got some interesting, interesting things in it. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations just as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Obey them completely, and you will display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation? For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I'm giving you today? You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while flames from the mountain shot into the sky. The mountain was shrouded in black clouds and deep darkness. And the Lord spoke to you from the heart of the fire. You heard the sound of his words, but didn't see his form. There was only a voice. He proclaimed his covenant the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to keep and which he wrote on two stone tablets. Let me read verse six to you again. Obey them completely and you will display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. See, this was the common sense by which God wanted people to live. And his intent was to bless people. It was through following these laws that God would actually impart wisdom and common sense to the people. That they would live, you know, having good sense and sound judgment in practical matters. And it would affect people to such a degree that it would actually impact the world. The world around them would recognize it. 
Well, about three months ago, I was directed to read in Exodus 20. And that's the passage that contains the list of the Ten Commandments. And the Holy Spirit told me to meditate on them. So I printed them off, and I actually printed Exodus 20 off, and I posted it on the inside of a cupboard on our kitchen. So that every morning when I opened it up, there it was, boom. It was right looking me in the face. Now I'd have to say, if you were to take a survey of how many Christians today could recite all the Ten Commandments, I bet you'd find that the percentage is pretty low. And I know this because when I took the challenge myself, I realized I couldn't recite them myself. And the reason is, is that in New, as New Testament believers, we really tend to focus on not the law, but the message of faith and grace. And so the law has sort of got dropped. In fact, there are believers who, if you refer the word law, as soon as they hear it, they dismiss it as irrelevant. They just write it right off. But these people err in that they believe grace makes us exempt from the law and that it has no place in our life. Now, it's really true. Salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ, and we cannot earn our salvation by keeping the law. But it doesn't negate the law and the effect that it has in our life. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 5, he said he came to fulfill the law. Listen, these are Jesus' words about the law. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus' take on this. And then just to put things in perspective, he adds, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus places a great importance on the law but he makes it clear the law is not gonna save you. He says, be really, really careful you don't miss or ignore it, but he warns us that you're never gonna keep it well enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then in the same passage in Matthew 5, Jesus reveals something quite important about the law. He says, basically, it's not just the letter of the law that we're to follow, but it's also the intent of the law. And he reveals that when he says, he tells us that we're not only guilty and destined for hell if we murder someone, we're, we're actually guilty of the same kind of thing if in our anger we actually curse someone with labels like idiot or fool. And Jesus said, it's not only enough to simply abstain from committing adultery, we're guilty of sin if we so much as look at another person with lust in our heart. No wonder we can't keep the law well enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. Who can do that? Who isn't guilty of these things? So when we read these Ten Commandments, it's important that we catch the heart of God. I really want you to ask for understanding, to see how these commands are meant to guide our lives so that we develop the art of living, as Josh Green put it. Isn't that an awesome statement? The art of living. This is what God wants us to do. Well, anyways, it was about a month after reading and pondering Exodus 20 for uh, that period of time that God, through the Holy Spirit, suddenly connected for me um, common sense and obeying the Ten Commandments. And so we're gonna read these Ten Commandments. I'm going to talk about them briefly. And um, hopefully the Holy Spirit will speak to you through this. Um, the setting for this passage is uh, the people are gathered around the base of Mount Sinai and Moses is telling them, uh, God's going to speak to you and they're about to meet the Lord as he speaks to them. So we're going to begin at Exodus 20, verse 1 to 20. 
Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued from the, you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or any image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations. Who? Holy Spirit, let that, let that land on us. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live full, long, of a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. In the NASB, it says, Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, new Lexus, uh, cottage, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come this way, in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. That's the purpose of the law, is so that we know what sin looks like and that we don't sin. But in Galatians 3.19, it says this, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Isn't that interesting? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. You see, these laws were meant to work in tandem with our reverential fear of God to keep us from sinning. The law defines sin, but God intends for us to keep from sinning by staying connected to him. They work hand in hand. In order to do this, we need to have a clear picture of what sin looks like. And the law does that. That's why these commandments are relevant for us today, just as they were for people back then. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, it talks about the man of lawlessness. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there's a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Well, I got thinking about this, and I really believe that it's not that there's not going to be any law. I think there's going to be tons of laws. But those laws and those ways of thinking are going to be in rebellion of God and his laws. You see, this lawlessness was secretly at work even at the time this scripture was written. It was already happening. There were people who were in rebellion against the law of God. 
And just as I shared at the beginning, in my lifetime alone, our society has moved a long ways away from God and his laws. And the effects are seen all over the place. They're seen in our education system. They're seen on television. They're seen in our views of sexuality and morality. They're affecting our constitutional rights, the, the escalating crime. There is so much going on. Even the legalization of things that 50 years ago would have been absolutely unthinkable. And most all of it can be traced to the rejection of God and his law. And we are not immune to this kind of lawlessness that's affecting our society. It, it influences our actions and our thinking way more than some of us realize. And that's why we really need to go back to God's word and be anchored in it. So I want to look at these Ten Commandments briefly. I know it takes a little bit of time and I, and I hope I'm not too long, but I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us through this. And I'm hoping that you will catch one thing whatever it is that God speaks to you. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would begin to minister in our hearts. And as I share this stuff, as we look very briefly at these 10 commandments, God, would you speak to our hearts? Would you impart to us what you want us to get a hold of today? Commandment one, you must not have any other God but me. Josh Green taught on the fear of the Lord and especially the part about how we as believers need to respond to God. And if you didn't hear that teaching, excuse me, I strongly suggest that you look it up on the website and you have a listen. In Psalm 14, it says this, only fools say in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race he looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. So this issue right here, this is what separates the fools from the wise. The wise person seeks God. The wise person acknowledges that God created heaven and earth. The wise person worships the living God and does so in reverence and humility. So common sense, wisdom, common sense, it begins with God. It begins with worshiping him alone. I love what it, how the message puts the verse in Proverbs 1, 7. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. I thought about this first commandment and I believe that it is nothing to do with about controlling us. Some people seem to think that God is egotistical and he needs our attention. But I honestly believe that this first commandment is so that we will live in wisdom and in truth. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. Commandment two, you must not make or worship idols. That's the short form. Short form. Um, idol worship takes many forms. Some of it's obvious, some of it's not so obvious. For some people, it looks like a golden calf or a statue of a false deity. For others, it looks like being involved in a false religion or a cult. For some, it's the pursuit of pleasure or immorality. For other people though, it could look like a career or sports or maybe a hobby or a motorcycle or a house or a person. Might be your kids, might be your mate. But probably the two biggest idols of our day are money and self. Regardless of the form, God doesn't want anything else to take first place in our life except him. He wants us to give him that place. That's our act of worship. To read in the scripture again, the Lord your God is a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. Well, in our pursuit for the presence of God, we can really and often do overlook the place that idols have in our life or that they may have in our life. The result is that 
we never seem to be able to enjoy the presence of God or the freedom of Christ that other believers talk about enjoying. We may overlook our idols, but God doesn't. You see, idol, idol worship actually removes us from the Lord's protection and it opens the door for demonic activity in our life. Paul addresses this very issue with the church of Corinth. In chapter 10, he says, what am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. Something to think about. If your parents or your grandparents or even your great grandparents were overt idol worshipers in any of the forms that I described, you may be experiencing difficulty encountering the Holy Spirit as God intends. You see, the sins and the effects of idol worship do get passed on to the kids for three or four generations. And if that's the case, you really do need to be set free of these things. And that involves confession, confessing this idol worship is sin. It involves renouncing the idol worship it involves implying the blood of Jesus to our lives and to the sin. And, and it involves also a prayer of deliverance from the demons that were given legal round to affect the entire family, including you. So this command is for your protection. Command three, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says, you know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. How we speak about the Lord Jesus and God the Father are really good indicators for whether or not we're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Before I repented of my rebellion towards God, I would often misuse his name. It was a way of expressing my unresolved anger towards him. It was my way of saying, God, I'm not happy with my life and you don't seem to be helping me and you're not changing anything and this is my way of letting you know. But what I didn't know was that I was simply being controlled by sin and I was being controlled by the demons that I'd opened myself up to. They were only too happy to have me dishonor the name of God with my words. In James, it says, sometimes it, our tongue, praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. I think the intent of this commandment is that we would honor God with our words in everything we say. Just honor him with your words. Let it be an act of worship. Let your words be an act of worship. Remember to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Common sense says people need to rest. And God has given this gift. It's actually a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. The day was made for us. And keeping it separate or holy is actually an act of worship. And this particular act of worship was intended to be a lifelong habit. Every week. It meets not only our need for rest and recovery, but it also reminds us that we are dedicated to the Lord, our God. I believe firmly that if for the rest of your life, you're willing to set one day aside that's dedicated to God, it will change the way you think. You know, we celebrate things that are important to us, like birthdays and anniversaries and Christmas and Easter and different celebrations. 
so many of us today have yielded our schedules around other things like work or gymnastics or hockey or dance or whatever it may be. You fill in the blank. The world's schedules have absolutely no regard for a Sabbath. But I want to ask you, what message does that send our kids or our grandkids? Do they see us honoring God first in our lives? Or are we full of compromise? Keeping the Sabbath, it doesn't only speak volumes to our kids and those around us, but it has also a, a weekly reminder to ourselves that God is our first priority. Keeping a Sabbath in our lives will affect some choices. It does. There's some sacrifice and choices, but then all personal disciplines require making some choices and sacrifice. Commandment five, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your God is giving you, that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you. <sighs> the violation of this commandment has resulted in an absolutely unbelievable amount of suffering in the lives of so many people. That it may go well with you is contingent upon honoring father and mother. So to the degree that you don't honor father and mother, it will not go well with you. See, honoring father and mother isn't just about father and mother. It's actually the place where we learn to honor authority figures. It's the place where we learn to honor God. Regardless of whether our parents or those authority figures do what we want them to do in the way that we want them to do, whether they treat us just the way we want or not. You see, if you were to look at the lives of people who do not know how to honor teachers or the police or government officials or church leaders, they probably not learn to honor father and mother in some point in their life, in some area of their life. And one of the ways people dishonor mom and dad is through bitter root judgments. No parent is perfect. Absolutely not. Some of them are absolutely horrible. That is true. The real issue is not about how good the parent is. The real issue is how are we going to respond to these wrongs that are done to us? If we judge them bitterly, we're going to be the ones who continue to suffer. Because those people are imperfect, our parents, those authority figures in our life, because they're imperfect, they're going to make mistakes, and those mistakes are going to cause us hurt. We're going to suffer for it. But we're going to have to forgive them because that's the only way we're going to be set free. That's the only way that we're going to be able to keep from becoming bitter and this is actually true of any authority figure. Anybody who's in your life, they're all imperfect people who are going to disappoint to some degree. And we must learn to forgive for our own sake. And just so you know, forgiveness is not about saying what was done was okay. It is exactly not that. It is saying what you did was hurtful, but I choose to cancel the debt you owe me. I choose to break the ties that are keeping me bound to you by demanding payment from you, a payment that you can't even pay back to me. And I release you to let God deal with you. And Jesus is our perfect example. He wants things to go well with us. Six, you must not murder. Well, the definition of murder is pretty straightforward for us, the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. I think most of us have no trouble understanding that murder is sin. Um, but what happens when a society changes the definition of what is lawful killing and what is not? Do we really think that we can redefine what constitutes an unlawful taking of life and not be guilty? The taking of a life is a serious matter before God. And what about Jesus telling us that we're equally guilty if in our anger we curse someone just by saying they're a stupid idiot? 
The term in the scripture is raka. It's a, it, it means empty-headed or foolish. They, Jesus puts those on the same level? In Don and Ruth's Rosu's counseling course, they make a case for defining sin as rejection. Rejection of God and his ways, but it's also our rejection of people and even our rejection of self. You see, sin is a rather abstract term, but rejection is something we can really get our hands on because all of us experience rejection in some form or another. We can all relate to it. So when Cain killed his brother Abel, he really rejected him. And murder really is the highest form of rejection that one person can do towards another. Well, we may never have never murdered someone, but we can all relate to rejecting people or God or even ourselves, especially when we feel hurt or neglected or misused or any kind of that kind of thing. So a good question to ask the Holy Spirit right now is, how have I rejected people? Or how have people rejected me and I've not dealt with it? Big or small, rejection is hurtful. So what debts are outstanding? What do you owe people? What do they owe you? Again, forgiveness is the vital key. Commandment seven, you must not commit adultery. Uh, God takes this sin far more seriously than most of us do today. Before the flood that destroyed the ancient world, God became grieved with all of mankind. Listen to this in Genesis. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. When you think about it, most all sexual sin takes place in our imaginations and in our thoughts before it ever gets acted upon. And I believe this is why Jesus pronounced us guilty if we even look on a person with lust in our hearts. We've already engaged our thoughts and imaginations. Sexual sin at its core is about taking from people. It's about using people. It's temporary in nature. It's about gratifying self at the expense of someone else. Whereas godly, holy sexual activity is about respecting and honoring and loving and making a lifetime commitment to someone. If you nurture an unhealthy thought life, I can tell you from personal experience, it's one of the surest ways to set yourself up for being defeated in the area of sexual purity. Demons will jump on and take every opportunity to energize your thoughts and your imagination until eventually you're gonna give in to the temptation. If your thought life played out in action, where would it take you? Of what sin would you be guilty? Do you honor people with your thoughts? Do you see people as objects for your pleasure? Or as living beings made to be the temples of the living God? You see, God already knows your thoughts. <laughs> he knows every one of them. But do we try and deceive ourselves to hiding them? It's impossible but we deceive ourselves and try. Or do you invite God into your thoughts? Do you expose them to him? Do you let him shine his light on them? And do you let him rule your thoughts? Number eight, you must not steal. Well, there, I don't know about you guys, but in our household, there's almost not a week goes by that we don't get scam phone calls for somebody trying to get into our bank account or our credit cards. The world is absolutely full of theft right now. And we all know that stealing's wrong, but why does it seem to be increasing exponentially? I believe that there is a very strong spirit of self-entitlement that's permeated our culture. 
and it has absolutely no regard for people or what it will cost them. It only seeks to take. That's what it does. The spirit will take. And the spirit of self-entitlement is exactly the opposite of the nature of God. You see, God, he's this generous father of lights. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. He gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike. He loves and gives, even to the point of giving us his son. You see, stealing isn't just about money or material gifts. What about time? What about words of praise, kindness, ministry, prayer? We can steal many things that don't belong to us. So my question is, are you a taker or are you a giver? It's a great common sense question to ask yourself. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. He'll show you. I'd say we're a mix. Some of us give in some areas and some of us take. Let the Holy Spirit show you. Number nine, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Oh boy, we're in a day. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, text messages, cyberbullying, false accusations, ruined careers, ruined reputations. <laughs> we live in an age where your reputation can be aligned in absolute moments by anyone who decides to spread false information about you and you have no ability to defend yourself. People have the opportunity right now to testify falsely or malicious like never before. And it isn't just about false witness in court. So my question is, do your words ruin the reputation of other people? In Ephesians, it says this, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. I believe this commandment is about speaking truth when we talk about other people. And the words that we speak about other people can bring life or death. We need to remember this. God wants us to impart life through our words. So ask yourself when you're about to speak or tweet or text something about someone, would I want someone saying this about me? Our last commandment, you must not covet. Hmm. Well, I want to tell you a little personal story about this one because I, I really fell into this one for years. I used to have a major craving for new things and it happened simultaneously um, every fall and every spring. Every spring I wanted a new house and every fall I wanted a new car. And I fed these cravings. I, I went to show homes and I drew floor plans and I went to the auto show every year and I really did my research on cars and I studied them and I went into it and I just kind of stayed in and it eventually it became an obsession. You ask my wife, she'll tell you. It was <laughs> for a long time I was controlled by this. And I began to realize that something wasn't right and I needed to know what was going on. And so finally I asked the Lord straight out, what is wrong? Why am I so obsessed with wanting these things? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and answered me. And immediately I knew in my spirit that my obsession was being driven by a spirit. It was a spirit of discontentment. And that's another common spirit in our day. So I confessed my sin of discontentment and coveting, and I renounced it. And I renounced the spirit that I had allowed to control me. And I asked God to free me from its grip and the power that it had in my life. And I began to thank God for the perfectly good car and the perfectly good home that we had in our possession right now. And I cannot tell you what an amazing change took place in my life. The, that craving for those things began to fade away almost immediately. So my question is, 
Are you satisfied with what you have? Are you grateful for what God has given you? I've thought about it, and isn't it interesting that keeping up with the Joneses is a cycle that seems to have no end? It's kind of like getting on the gerbil wheel. You know, it's, there is no end to it. There's always a new cell phone, a new toy, a new TV, a better job, a new this, a new that. It never ends. And I've also found that curing our overwhelming desire for things is never satisfied by acquiring stuff. It just doesn't happen. We will only become satisfied with what we have when we begin to give thanks for what we already have and by acknowledging our God that he is the provider. And I'm speaking firsthand on this one. I know it. The more you cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving, the less you'll be likely to covet. So let me close off. Those are the Ten Commandments. They're a law. But as we just shared a little bit here, there's more than just the straightforward things to think about. There's intent behind it. And what does the Holy Spirit want to say? So I want to close off by this passage of Scripture and then just a couple closing comments. In Romans 7, it says, Well, then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But then I learned the command not to covet, for instance. The power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. For I'm all too human and a slave to sin. See, these laws, this was the common sense that God wanted us to have. This is the way he wants us to think. And the truth of the matter is, our natural man is not inclined towards it. Our self-centeredness is actually opposed to these things. When Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees about which the, what was the greatest law, what was the greatest commandment, he gave the most concise, all-inclusive summary of the law. Love God and love people as yourself. This is the common sense that God wants us to have and how he wants us to live. Religion would lay a heavy burden on you to fulfill all these commands perfectly or else. But I'm telling you, we can't do it in our own efforts. Even Paul responds to this passage that I just read to you and he says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace is amazing. His kindness, his forgiveness, it's ours. He paid for the price for every shortcoming, for every sin, and he empowers us with his very presence. Again, I want to remind you, it's the knowledge of the law 
prepared with the presence of the Holy Spirit that will enable us to keep from sinning and to actually fulfill the law. So I want to encourage you to rest in his forgiveness. Rest in the righteousness that's yours in Christ Jesus. Invite God to walk in fellowship with you. Ask him to give you his common sense. Let him guide you in your daily decisions as you rest in his presence. And just pay attention to what he shows you because he's speaking and he loves you.